tonight, we will hear from Mark Dion and Alexis Rockman in a truly unique way. Our conversation with them will be moderated by Callie Mitchum and Salome Walker, two exceptional students from the Virginia Beach Public Schools Environmental Studies Program uh, at the Chesapeake Bay Foundation's Brock uh, Environmental Center. This, their presence here tonight is made possible through the invaluable support and partnership of Chris Freeman, their dedicated teacher and environmental studies program coordinator. Our Our collaboration with Chris and his students dates back to our 2022 exhibition, Maya Lynn, A Study of Water, where we fir first witnessed the profound impact of their involvement. Tonight, we're proud to continue this par partnership thanks to the exhibitions that we are here to celebrate. Not only are Chris's students moderating tonight, but other students from the program have lent their voices to our audio tour and are part of the peer-to-peer -peer learning project initiated by Virginia Mocha in collaboration with SeaTac Elementary. Tonight, we are excited to hear from Mark and Alexis while spotlighting youth voices through Callie and Salome. Their presence underscores the vital role of the next generation in shaping discussions on art, the environment, and our future. Let's give them all a warm welcome. How do we start this? <laughs> yes. uh, well, hi everyone, my name is Callie Mitchum. I'm a senior at the Environmental Studies Program and I'm so excited to be here with everyone tonight. Um, our first question is based on how you all differ in your approach to art. Um, being able to per preview the show, Salome and I were both really inspired by both of your bodies of work and even though that they're done with completely different mediums, there's an environmental thread that ties the show together. Could each of you tell us a little bit about the medium you use and why you chose that medium to convey your specific artistic message? I'll start. <laughs> painting seemed like the only thing to do once I started painting, which was pretty late in my life, 22, really. So, um, 22 years old. So, and there's a long tradition of representing the natural world through painting and those mediums. That's it. <laughs> some people paint, some people take photographs, some people sculpt, and I shop. And that's my medium, I'm very good at it, and I truly enjoy it, and not a flea market or antique mall is safe with me around. So I'm always uh, working on a, a wide variety of projects and I'm looking and searching for just the right things, uh, objects that have obtained the proper patina and it's not easy to do that, right? And I, I do lots of other things, and I, can, I, can, I work with other artists who help me, who can sculpt for me, who can paint for me, who can uh, you know, drive me around. Uh, <laughs> but it's, it's very hard to find someone who can actually shop for you. So I always try to, I do the like seven hammer test, where I lay out seven hammers, and I say, okay, here's the scenario. We're talking about a turn of the century, middle of America, biological lab, which of these hammers is the right one? And nobody can get that. <laughs> can I go back for a second? Because now I feel competitive. Um, <laughs> I want to say that the reason that I think painting matters now in this culture, we all have phones, we're obsessed with, you know, what our friends and enemies are up to. Um, and painting brings people out of their little shells Thank you for coming out tonight. And to see something in person that has scale, that's bigger than you, you have a visceral reaction to it, and it's not on your phone, even though it better look good on your phone also. And the other issue is, is that if I want to tell stories about time travel and you know, deal with ideas that you can't photograph, what better thing to do than to make a painting about it? I think that is one thing we definitely 
noticed when we actually got to see the exhibit is that it's completely different than when we were looking at it on our computers trying to come up with these questions. We were like astounded by the scale and all of the interesting things that you've done. So that was great. Hi, I'm Salome Walker. Um, I'm really excited to be here tonight. Um, we'd like to know where you create your art and where the best place to create art is. And what about these places gets you in the kind of inspired mood? Uh, you know, I, I'm not really like a studio artist. I, and that never really appealed to me to go into a room and to work with a blank wall or a bunch of clay or, you know, it's, it's, I work on, on location. And, you know, to me, like making stuff on site, uh, the, the site always the site always tells me what to do in a sense. You know, I go to a place and I don't arrive, you know, without with nothing. But I carry my suitcases of concerns with me. But then I want the place to tell me uh, what to do. What, what's special about this place? What's interesting? Who's lived here before? What mistakes have they been made? And you know, through that, I kind of understand what my response is going to be to, lo to the location. And because I hate the whole convention of art shipping, which is so wasteful and expensive, I love to actually make things in the place where they're going to be shown. I'm pretty different um, in that I love the white cube, my studio, as Mark said. I had a studio in Tribeca in Manhattan for 33 years where I grew up in Manhattan, not in my studio. Well, I did that too. Um, and I made it the way I wanted, and then I, for, to make a long story short, had to leave right before COVID and moved to Connecticut and built a new studio, and Mark walked in and said, oh, it's exactly the same, except you have sort of a window. <laughs> so I don't want to have anything to do with where I am other than in my own head, and I am obsessed with order and I can't see anything with chaos and a mess, but then I go on these trips and like the field drawings from the Great Lakes were part of a project I did about the, um, the history and future of the Great Lakes. So I went around to different sites, went to many different places around all of the Great Lakes except for Lake Superior and collected uh, materials so I can have a chance to be in connection to these places with intimacy. They're made out of dirt, soil, made things out of blood, wombat poop over the years, you know, anything that sticks to the paper. But paradoxically, then I go back to my white cube and make it there. So I'm full of contradictions. Our next question is a little bit more specific. Uh, could each of you tell us a story about one of your pieces of work that's here tonight? We'd like to hear a little bit about your creative process. Um, gosh, there's so many pieces. Yeah, I'm. You know, I mean, honestly, my my favorite work in the show is one of the most modest ones. It's called uh, "On Tropical Nature," and there's the one that's a small vitrine, and there's a box next to it. And so, I I was invited to do a project um, in the early '90s in Venezuela, and you know, I was I always wanted to go to the tropical rainforest. It was it was like a great dream of mine. So one of the good things about being an artist is you you know you rewrite the job description every day. So I was like, well, this, in this project, I must go to the jungle, and I must go for weeks on end. So I came up with a project where I asked the museum to have four empty tables um, in, in the museum. And then I would go out for four weeks, and every week I would collect materials, um, traveling in the, in the Amazon uh, region of Venezuela. I would collect materials, they, I collected them for very specific reasons, and I would send them in a box, and then the box would go from my canoe to a speedboat, to uh, Puerto Ayacucho, where it would get on a, a truck, go to the airport, fly across country, get on another truck, go to the museum. And I told the people at the museum that I would give them instructions as to how they were supposed to put these objects on the tables, but I didn't you know, give them instructions. In fact, that, the whole point was never to give them instructions. So they would open these boxes, and they'd be like, what the heck is this? And so they would just pile this stuff up on the first table. And then the second box comes, and they realize like, oh, this guy's never going to give us instructions, is he? And so they begin to organize things and 
in, in their way. They're like, oh, no sweat. We're, we're curators. We know how things go together. We know long things go with long things, round things go with long, round things. And so as the, as the project goes on, they get more and more refined in their dealing with the material. So for me, that's like a really nice project that has a very strong um, uh, conceptual backbone. It's something that increases my interest in my life, and I get to do something that is not easy to do. And, you know, and in the end, it's a kind of quite interesting, visually compelling work. So for me, that, it's the earliest work in, in the show, it's from me, it's, it's 1992, I think. And for me, it's still my favorite. Inspiring. <laughs> um, I was gonna talk about something else, but now that he said that, I <laughs> have to, that, no, it's poignant because it's the earliest piece of mine in the show, and it's called Forest Floor. And it's the orange painting with the giant insects. And I don't know if it's in the... Okay. So when I was a kid, I grew up in Manhattan, and I was an only child, and, you know, I had good times and bad times. And the thing that was a beacon of hope and excitement and enchantment was the Museum of Natural History, like many kids in the city. And the, the Bronx Zoo was a mixed bag because you could see these wonderful animals, but then they were, like, in prison. And it was really depressing before the... World Wildlife Conservation sort of took over. So when I was a kid, my mom worked at the Museum of Natural History, and she was Margaret Mead's assistant secretary, the famous anthropologist. She's a professional archaeologist who retired a couple of years ago. And I remember somehow wandering the halls where I would get lost, still get lost, um, and there was this diorama called Forest Floor, which takes a, a meter of maybe a half a meter of uh, soil from Central Park, right across the, the um, Central Park West, and blows it up to enormous proportions. So as a little kid, I would look up at this diorama, which was giant leaves and the daddy long legs and a millipede. These are things that were enchantedly across the street. And I was like, oh, there's so much, you know, there's life everywhere. And Mark and I have an obsession with urban uh, wildlife um, because it lives in spite of our best efforts to crush it. Um, <laughs> And they remind us of our mortality. So as I got older and older, this diorama, which is probably about 12 feet wide, got smaller and smaller as I got bigger. And finally, I could see over the top and look, um, you know, and actually see what was going on at the, at the back of the diorama when I got to be like 15 or something like that. So when I was working on a show, I was thinking about that diorama. And I thought, I should make a painting about that. And it's really about my love of the Museum of Natural History. I went and took a bunch of photographs there and went back to my studio, took the uh, C train down to Franklin Street and got off. And, you know, I remember working on that painting at Thanksgiving of 1989 and listening to the new Public Enemy album. And I was so irritated. I had to go to Thanksgiving and actually deal with that. And I wanted to just work on that painting. <laughs> <coughs> Both of your works on display are very complex and filled with tiny details. So how do you guys determine when a piece is finally finished? Mm. <laughs> um, that's, that used to be a, a real problem for some reason. I, I, I think there's a, 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 a I've, I have a sort of rule that if I think of something that I want to do to it and then I realize I'm going to ruin it, it's done. Um, as um, Jenna, who is the uh, AFA's um, registrar, who travels with the show, makes sure everything is okay, um, I drive her crazy because these pieces aren't finished, and I add things to them all the time. <laughs> and so I feel like it's, it's kind of finished when it's no longer my property. But up until that moment, I can, you know, there's a, quite, a, quite a few things that have been added uh, and during this run, and and next exhibition, I'm sure there'll be more. So, until until I no longer own them, I think I can say they're not finished. Um, we've all heard the Bob Ross quote that there are no mistakes, just happy accidents. I know that I can be quite the perfectionist, but sometimes art isn't always that simple. Could you tell us about a time when a mistake that you made or something happened in your art that turned into a happy accident? I guess. Um, I would say that the arc of my career and the way I think about making work has sort of gone 
in and out of those ideas of what it, you know, I'm completely OCD in case you haven't noticed. But I also am self-aware enough and worked hard enough to be self-aware enough to know that that is not necessarily the best thing about what I do. And I'm also really good at making spontaneous, painting spontaneously and having a sort of different relationship to making work. So I have tried to, when I've started my career, there were a lot of, there would be, it would happen very fast. And there's something about being a young artist where everything's exciting because you haven't done anything yet. And then you get to a point where you try to control it. And then I'm at a point in the last couple of years where I'm really back in the discovery of what watercolor and oil paint can do in a way that I've never seen before. And that's really the, once I figure out the image sort of in my mind about what I want it to look like, I sort of let it go and it becomes this alchemaic soup that is frankly very toxic and bad for the environment. <laughs> and then I go back and put, try to herd the cat back into the track that I wanted it to be in. You know, I, I think sometimes I make projects where I, I like to set up rules without knowing what's going to happen in the end. So I'll work with something where I'll be traveling somewhere and I'll be collaborating with the Natural History Museum and I will send them a list of all the, all the animals I see in the day and they have to go to their back room and if they have that animal, they bring it out. So I don't know, you know, because I'm on the other side of the world and somehow I'm getting a note to a hotel that has a fax machine that sends this thing and then they get this list but I don't know until long after if this work pro worked or not. Like, was the table that I set up empty or was it full? And so I do really enjoy setting up things that could go wrong and sometimes do, but, um, but it's more about creating these kind of rules that in some way they secretly reveal the subjective nature of the collection of the museum itself. So um, they can go wrong and sometimes they don't have anything. You know, if on a list of 14 birds, they might have one. Callie and I are both so inspired by your work and your ability to evoke emotion in the viewer. We were wondering who are your biggest artistic influences and which artists evoke emotion in you? What was that? <laughs> <laughs> so you want to know who, what art we like? that are like we're your biggest influences I mean there's there's a gazillion people listen I, I can't speak for Mark but I, I might as well we are built <laughs> we, whatever we're doing is built on the shoulder of giants that we love and so many artists that are fantastic that are inspiring and I'm constantly thinking of Goya Turner Mark Kiefer Corbet G whatever there's so many people I'm having a conversation with every day when I'm making work. So it's really like I have this fantasy. I, I don't know where I got it from where, you know, I, and this is really a fantasy because I don't think it's going to happen. Oh, I also want to say one thing. You know, when you're talking about my work, it's not surrealism. I'm a documentarian. So just be clear about that. Um, I'm, I'm a journalist uh, from the future. Um, I have this fantasy that I'm going to, it's a, did anyone see Stairway to Heaven, that, um, the, uh, the, the, that fabulous movie about um, uh, uh, World War II? Anyway, there's this, there's, I have this fantasy. I go up the staircase, and there's all my favorite artists, and um, Goya, and so Rembrandt, and, and somehow I'm not run out of town. <laughs> I mean, I think like Alexis and, and like many of the artists I know, we are art lovers, right? We, we are just enormous fans and, and look through the history of art. I think one of the most interesting things about being an artist, I mean, what I'm, why I'm in the game is, is to have a dialogue with the history of art. And if you work on the topic of, of the, our relationship to nature and our relationship to animals, you have a direct line going right back to the beginnings of human mark making, right? And there's, there are people who are working on these topics at every, mo every movement in that history. So that's great. So there's so many people we're inspired by, and whether that's um, Joseph Boyce performances, or the Hudson River School, or, uh, or the, um, the Northern Renaissance still life painters. I mean, we're there for all of it. And it, you know, I, I teach a fair amount. And so when I go into a, 
uh, students' um, uh, studio, and I look at them and say, so who's interesting to you? Who do you look at? And they sit back and, and say like, oh, you know, I'm really bad with names. And I'm like, really? Like, if, I, if, you, if, we're, if I was a poet, visiting you as a young poet, and I asked, what poetry do you read? And you said, oh, I'm really bad with names. I would just think you're an idiot. So that's, that's my kind way of telling them that they're idiots, because they, it certainly is something they should know, is who are their, who are their influences? What, what, are they, what do they love? What are they trying to emulate? What are they trying to better? I couldn't agree more. I just wanted to tell a short anecdote about that. When I started my, I knew I wanted to be an artist at a certain point, but I didn't realize I would go back to my natural history love until maybe a year or two later. But I knew it was going to have representational stuff in it. So I woke up every morning and copied an old master drawing. And I would not leave the house until I was done. And that would mean Michelangelo. You know, I could draw anything, Matisse, anything. And I would just, you know, sometimes it would take me two seconds, sometimes it would take me all morning, or the whole day, basically, to, if you're going to do a Michelangelo. But So it was just wanting to really be in a context of, you know, stuff that we love is what we, we want to be in that conversation. My next question is a little long, so you got to prepare yourself. <laughs> I'm really excited, yeah. <laughs> I'm really excited about it from a scientific standpoint, though. So I'm going to start with the question and then give some sciencey words. Um, because of the environmental aspects of your work, some people have categorized it as Anthropocene art. Um, there is a scientific debate over when humanity officially entered the Anthropocene, which is the unofficial name of the current geologic era, which, in the words of National Geographic, describes the period in Earth's history when human activity started to have a significant impact on the planet. I was wondering if either of you would consider yourselves Anthropocene artists, and if you have an opinion on when this new era began. For some context, scientists are torn on whether this era began during the Neolithic Revolution when agriculture began, or in the 20th century with, with the Industrial Revolution. Some people even believe that we haven't reached the Anthropocene yet and we're still in the Holocene, which began after the last Ice Age and is known as the Age of Man as opposed to the Age of Man's impact, like the Anthropocene. So, what are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. It's, it's interesting because I think that, you know, people are, people accept the Anthropocene, except for geologists and other, and, but, you know, it is, you know, scientists don't have a monopoly on what we get to call nature, right? And, and if people public, if the population, if, if the popular people believe in the Anthropocene, let's just go with that, right? And the geologists will sort it out later. Um, but, you know, I mean, for me, I always thought an, a, a place that I would set this is really uh, in, in 1492. I mean, that is an, an event that is dramatic, that reshapes the world, that, uh, that really, um, you know, the, the sort of um, the bio side, the ethno side, the uh, spread of global capitalism, the beginnings of the most pernicious colonialism, all begins there. And I think that that's, that for me would be a good, a good place to put that pin. Uh, I agree with that, but I have a slightly different perspective in that I think once humans left Central Africa, the, that is the beginning of the end for everything else on the planet uh, about 200,000 years ago. Um, I think then you could say 1492, you could say the invention of plastic could be the beginning of the end. Um, we've been doing this so long that the term Anthropocene came along well after our careers were established, so I would not, never attach myself to something that is so recent and unproven. But I think that th there's a positive side to framing it as the Anthropocene because at least it accepts that humans are screwing shit up. It's, it's kind of profound as well because when you think about your geologic time scale, which you've used in your work sometimes, we're like a fingernails width of that time frame. So right. to be so naive almost as to name uh, like 50 years of it after us or 100 years of it after us it's definitely speaks to the message of this, this exhibit. 
on that note, um, because your bodies of work deal so heavily with environmental issues, we were wondering that if you had to pick one, would you consider yourself more of an activist or an artist? <laughs> go ahead. I have to go on that one? Uh, you know, I, 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 am not, I don't think I'm an activist. I think I'm, I'm very much aligned with, um, with activism, and I'm very, uh, uh, you know, I think that in a way the, that in every walk of life, people can be thinking about this stuff and discussing it and trying to make changes, whether you're um, you know, uh, a mail carrier or a lifeguard or a teacher, that there's a, there's, this is like an all hands on deck situation here. So, but uh, you know, I know activists, I know people who are, are real activists and they don't sleep and they are not as selfish as artists. So I really get a sense that, that I am very much aligned with these causes, but I would not consider myself um, an activist. Um, I pretty much ag agree with that. I mean, we are artists. We're here under the auspices of art, and if I, every time I try to be an activist, it's a failure. So, um, I'm a failed activist. <laughs> I mean, la all kidding aside, I've tried my best. When I made Manifest Destiny, twenty five years ago, started it, and it finished in 2004, it showed what, I th what, what the scientific community consensus was, what the melted ice cap was going to do to New York City. And I worked with James Hansen and Cynthia Rosenzweig and all these great scientists who were super generous to me. And the show um, opened at the Brooklyn Museum in May, 15, May 15th of uh, 2004, and I had a huge article on the cover of the Times arts and leisures and blah, blah, blah. And I thought, oh, I'm saving the world. It's great. You know, we're, I'm going to turn things around. And two weeks later, the day after tomorrow, that terrible movie about <laughs> global warming, it just was like turned it into a joke. And here we are. We are so beyond the point of no return with this stuff. And we had our window of opportunity. So I'm a failure. Bummer. <laughs> Um, Don't take it so hard. <laughs> You're not the only one. I know. At least I didn't put all my eggs in that basket. My next question is for Mark. Um, in your work, I kind of see you contrasting some kind of classification method that's almost taxonomic with a thoughtful title. Um, for example, I really enjoyed Cabinet of Marine Debris, which displays not natural items like you would assume from the title, but fishing waste from humans. For me, I feel like it forces the viewer to look inwardly into how we interact with nature in a way that's kind of ominous. Could you tell us a little bit more about your overall intent and the environmental themes in that piece of work? I think, you know, I, I think my work is a, way, is a way for me to try to understand how we as a society evolved a suicidal relationship to the planet, right? Like, where did that come from? And I think that that's really encoded in the history of ideas, right? So that's why, I mean, this show starts with, um, with the, the staircase of life, you know, the scala natura, Aristotle's idea, or the world, the uh, idea from the classical world that certainly Aristotle was a big part of, uh, in which sees all life as an unbroken chain from the things that have the least soul, the least value, to the things that have the most value, of course, um, Greek philosophers, right? The people, who create, <laughs> the people who create the systems of classification are often at the top of the system of classification. I wonder why. So, you know, like that idea of seeing ourselves as separated, I mean, Aristotle saw that there are differences in life and that, you know, one could make observations and, 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 uh, and taxonomies, um, but that these, are, these taxonomies shouldn't be based on value, a value system, right? Um, and this this infuses the idea of hierarchy into our understanding of nature, which is, is an, an alien imposition onto nature. Nature doesn't have a hierarchy. Nature doesn't have meaning in that sense. But that idea of classifying things sticks with us for a long time. I mean, that's an idea that has legs, right? It starts in the classical world, and it's still here. And there's all sorts of things, uh, um, you know, from from class to race to our relationship with animals that are poisoned by this really pernicious notion. So that's like a big part of, um, you know, that's, that's how I start the show because that's what I'm trying to 
understand that this pursuit of order onto nature um, is, uh, is fraught with political consequences. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that was a great answer. <laughs> <laughs> My, <laughs> did you want to add? I, I know. She has a question for you, I, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> this question is for you. <laughs> Looking through your portfolio, your unique and diverse perspectives captivated me. I specifically enjoyed the contrast between the farm and pioneers. In the farm, the emphasis is all on land animals showing the ground and skyline, whereas in pioneers, you take the viewer below ground, submerging them in the chaos that is happening below water. My question is, can you walk us through how you decide the perspective of each piece and how it helps you deliver the message? I'll try to make that short because it could be long-winded. Let's do it chronologically. I was, when I, I was approached to do the farm by Ann Pasternak, who was then the director of Creative Time, to do a, a public art project showing what the genetic revolution was going to do in 1999. And she said, whatever you want to do, do it. And I have someone lined up who's going to buy the painting. How much time do you need? I said, give me a year. And I thought, you know, what is the, this is 1999, what is the genetic revolution going to bring to us? And I thought, Food, right? So I started to think about the representations of farms and food in America, and I felt that there was a tremendous ambivalence about what this revolution was going to bring. People are scared of it. It's called Frankenfood. What is it going to do? Are we going to have jellyfish for arms? What's going to happen to us? What's going to happen to the world? And I wanted to take that and contextualize it within the tradition of representing artificial selection, which is the ancestor of the genetic revolution, which is taking animals and plants and breeding them to bring traits to the surface that you want to exploit, like corn or tomatoes or things like that. And so I got in touch with Rob DeSalle, who's the head of molecular biology at the Museum of Natural History, and he walked me through how things were different from the tradition of that. So that's why that painting looks like, on a certain level, um, mid-20th century American paintings of farms and landscapes with a bit of um, uh, uh, early Miro just because of this sort of hallucinatory sense of light and stuff like that. Grant Wood, people like that I, I was thinking about. So in Pioneers, it's actually how, how animals got into the Great Lakes, right? It was a project about the Great Lakes and it was one of the five big paintings for that. And I thought I'm gonna break it in half. The Great Lakes are just a glorified puddle left from a glacier that uh, receded from the last ice age, right? It's a lot of water, but it's still just a puddle. And I thought, how did it, what got there? So I started to ask um, ichthyologists about what were the first fish that got in there, and there's a freshwater burbot, there's certain types of trout, there's a, a, a sturgeons and stuff like that. So on the left are those fish entering this new world, and there's a glacier, and on the right, is the other way that animals and plants get into places all over the world, which is from ballast, from ships, in this case, that came from other parts of the world and are bringing billions of eggs and larvae and seeds and all sorts of stuff that are stuck in the water that's used as ballast in these ships and that just dumps them into these lakes. And suddenly, all these plants and animals and fish that have, don't have any predators, they're so excited, they're jumping for joy, and that's what that cascade of those little things coming down from the right are coming out of that ship, and they have a bright future. So that's why you're looking up. It's from the perspective of things that have a bright future. All right, well, we are reaching the end of our time, so my last question for you all is that if there is one message you want the audience to take away from your work tonight, what would it be? If you buy the work, you will live longer. <laughs> And if you don't, you're in deep trouble. <laughs> you know, there, there used to be, in, in Japan, there would be these, um, uh, these stories about demons who uh, would create a great plague unless you bought prints that would depict the demon. And then if you bought these prints, they would, uh, they would nullify the catastrophe that was coming. So, it may be something like that. Exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, we are, we both, uh, you know, we both love this world and we love art and I, we feel like we're just squandering it. So, I mean, that's what we're trying to talk about is why are we squandering 
our own planet. And how do we do it? Well, thank you oh, so thank much. You. I've got to say, I'm not sure who is the most impressive on this stage. The wonderful artists we have there are the incredible students who have clearly, clearly done their homework. I just want to say thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Alexis and Mark. I think you are officially off the hook and done for the evening and enjoy. And thank you, Callie and Salome. It was really fantastic. And thank you all. Have a wonderful evening. Um, and bring your friends back to the show. Thanks. Thank you.